He was a non-stop loudmouth <laughs> and stayed that way for his whole life. With the release of Pink Floyd The Later Years, a massive new box set from one of the greatest bands the world has ever seen, comes your chance to hear the real story of this legendary time in a whole new light. I'm David Gilmour, and welcome to The Lost Art of Conversation, a Pink Floyd podcast. Throughout this series, we'll delve into four key elements of Pink Floyd's creative output from 1987 to today. He was the sort of guiding force behind most of our artwork. He was brilliant. The Lost Art of Conversation, a Pink Floyd podcast. I drew a picture myself of a bed which was empty and I said to Storm, I'm thinking something about, you know, this, this line from a song, a vision of an empty bed. And he said, how about we have 500 empty beds? This is episode three, the artwork. David Gilmore from Pink Floyd. Hi, Matt. <laughs> so, we've looked, <laughs> so we've looked at the studio work that's encapsulated in this new box set. We've looked at the tours that took place. Um, the artwork, yeah. the, the visual language of Pink Floyd yes. has always been a very potent thing. Um, can you tell me a bit about that relationship with Storm Thorgerson? Let's start there, because... Storm was a friend of mine. I met Storm when he was, when I was 13, I think he was 15, in Cambridge at a place by the river, which is in the film for uh, High Hopes, that particular little bridge, and that was a place where we used to meet. And um, he was a, a non-stop loudmouth and stayed that way for his whole life. And uh, he was the sort of guiding force behind a lot, most of our artwork throughout the years, until he died. He was brilliant. Brilliant ideas person and brilliant at getting things done, you know. Didn't necessarily take the photos himself and collated ideas from other people, but um, was always there at the, at the heart of it. And always wanted to do everything properly, whatever it cost. <laughs> Which we'll come on to in a minute. So, yeah, I mean, he, he was one of the people responsible for some of these incredible... Um, iconic is the word that everybody uses. The iconic covers of Wish We're Here and Dark Side of the Moon. When it came to A Momentary Lapse of Reason, you are not only expected to follow the musical footsteps of Pink Floyd, you're also expected to visually produce something that's got the weight and the scale and the creativity that those previous album covers had. How do you go about that? <laughs> well, with difficulty. Um, I, um, I drew a picture myself of a room with a window and a bed, which was empty, bedside table with a picture frame on it with nothing in it. And I said to Storm, I'm thinking something about, you know, this, this line from a song, a vision of an empty bed. And I showed him this picture and he said, yeah, okay, but how about we have 500 empty beds? <laughs> and I said, show me. So they got down there to Saunton Sands and put all those beds up and took that picture, and which took a, a massive amount of work and time and hundreds of people having to move them all and then rush them all away again as the tide came in and then rush them all back again and, and do it again. There's some footage of, of the day that was shot that's included in the box set. You yeah. can sort of see them unloading and packing. These are like, they're not... I don't know, stage beds. They're big metal frame beds. Yeah, they're 700. sort of hospital beds, yeah. This is the standard sort of style of old hospital beds. Hypnosis always believed in doing things for real. We always believed in going to the location, always photographing where we possibly could, things in situ. Um, that was one of our trademarks. Aubrey Poe Powell is the creative director on the Later Years box set. He co-founded the company Hypnosis with Storm back in 1967. And when Storm created Momentary Lapse of Reason, of course, um, Sod's Law, it rained. So they had to take all the beds off the beach. And he had to phone the manager, Steve O'Rourke, and say to him, Steve, we didn't get the shot. And it cost a fortune, you know. Steve wasn't amused at all. And uh, they had to go back the next week when it was a sunny day and do it all over again. You had to have them all put in place. They all had to be organized and choreographed by storm to look in the right way. You had 
dogs there, you had uh, actors there playing parts. There was a French maid, I don't know why. There was a guy who was in one of the beds. Then you had all the camera crew, that we had a helicopter. There was all this stuff that was going on. So it was probably a crew of about 50 people, I should think, let alone all the transportation, all the feeding of everybody, and doing something like that is like creating a movie. I think most of the work that hypnosis did, you know, whether we set a man on fire for Wish You Were Here or whether it's beds on the beach for a momentary lapse of reason, um, people think we're absolutely barking mad. But I, I think the, the, the thing is that when you do things for real and you don't manipulate it digitally, you get a much more emotional effect. Um, you know, it's just the fact that you've been there and done it and you're prone to the elements that surround you. You're, you have to invest it with so much in order to get the shot you want that I think it shows in the end, in the end picture. And I think that's the important thing. What makes some images Pink Floyd images and others not? Some, there's a certain quality I don't know what it is that makes that is a Pink Floyd image that, for some reason, isn't it? Which way round does it go? I, I don't mean, know. I is don't it, know. Is the, does the image become a Pink Floyd image because it's on a Pink Floyd record, or does it...? Uh, you always want it to be an iconic image that grabs people. You know, I guess Storm was right in saying that my image could have been very nice, photographed beautifully and have been atmospheric, but maybe not as iconic as, as his take on it. I think there has to be, and we're sitting here, and I can see a, a, a painting of Battersea Power Station next to me. Um, there has to be... That's by a Scottish artist called Rennie Tate. It's lovely. There's got to be this kind of strong graphic image, but there's yeah. got to be humour in there as well, I think. Mm. Even if something like Wish You, wish you Were Here is quite a, yeah. it's quite a dark humour, but it's still mm. quite a funny image in many yes. ways. Yeah. And I think The Beds is a very similar illustration of that. There's the bit of the Magritte in there. Yeah, it's kind of surreal. I mean, people would want, would normally speaking, people would usually do that uh, with Photoshop and with, with digital technology. Even in those days, there were ways of cutting and pasting and doing that sort of thing, but Storm absolutely wouldn't hear of it, ever. And it all had to be done for real. I think that the reality of, of doing it the proper, right, real way um, does come across. Division Bell is two large statues, like Easter Island, and Storm got the original idea from the Easter Island statues. They were always very close to our hearts in hypnosis. We'd actually done an album cover for a band called Styx, which was a series of women at a cocktail party who were on Easter Island with Easter Island figures behind. So it was always in our consciousness somewhere. And when Storm decided to do, do Division Bell, he kind of felt that this Easter Island imagery of two of those figures talking to each other was the way to go. You know, if you listen to the tracks on Division Bell, things like Keep Talking and all that sort of thing, you know, it, it's all about communication or the lack of communication between people. So these two figures talking together it was very symbolic. And first of all, they made the images out of cardboard. You know, huge cardboard images that they put together just to see if it would work. He then got a guy called Keith Breeden to come in, who was a, a bona fide uh, designer in the theatre and film world, to actually draw them up and create them, and to build these extraordinary statues, which are, which are the size you see them. They're enormous, although they're made out of polystyrene and they're made out of wood and stuff like that. They're not actually made out of metal and stone. But the brief was to make them look like that. Storm then took them to an old disused airport uh, called Witchford, which was just outside the Isle of Ely, outside the, and it's Ely Cathedral in the background, which interestingly enough is where I went to school. So there's a huge emotional content there for me. And then proceeded to photograph and to film it in situ. I have to say, I always take my hat off to Pink Floyd because they're so trusting and so gracious to allow us to do imagery and create uh, everlasting pictures that are phenomenally expensive to do, are extraordinarily difficult to do. And I think where most 
rock and roll groups would have thrown up their hands and said, oh, just put a picture of us on the front. <laughs> but they don't want that. And it's just such a joy to work with people who actually say, yeah, go away and do that again. Would Storm and, and Poe enthusiastically throw sheets of paper at you and you guys would just nod and say, here's the, here's well, the, yes, here's well, the credit card, off you go. <laughs> well, that sort of thing. I mean, often, <laughs> often there are dozens and um, often dozens get discarded and aren't used, you know. The dark side of the moon moment was absolutely, you know, and there was never any question that that was the right image. One simple, stark, iconic picture, but, um, you know, those things are hard to come by. Storm always would find a way of doing something iconic, is the word, I guess. What was he like to work with on projects? Which I think is probably quite a simple question with a very complex answer. Um, well, luckily, I wasn't around when he was doing the you know nuts and bolts of this thing, and there are too numerous to mention people who will tell you he was a tyrant. But there are also people who would say he was a tyrant, but they loved to work for him because he would get the job done. And however many tears had been wept by however many people in, in the process, the result was worth it. Storm and I were partners in hypnosis for 15 years and then we went on to form a film company together and then we fell out about money, what else? And we didn't speak to each other for 10 years. And then the last years of his life, we were very close. We were brothers, you know, we loved each other. We were very close. And I have to say that Storm was probably the most cantankerous, difficult person you could possibly want to be partners with. He would find an objection around every corner. However, his dedication to the work and his dedication to ideas, which often came from his dreams. He'd often walk into hypnosis studio and say, I dreamed this image last night, and suddenly, oh, there it is, drawn on a piece of paper, and suddenly we were selling it to some band, and suddenly I was photographing it, because in hypnosis, Storm was often the ideas man, and I was often the photographer. I often interpreted Storm's ideas into what actually you see on the front cover of album covers. And that's how we worked. But we had a very volatile relationship. And Storm could be volatile, and volatile with clients. I mean, Storm stood his ground over imagery and pictures that he believed in, and I can remember many a fight with people like Peter Gabriel and with David and Roger. And some people did not like to work with him particularly. Paul McCartney was never too keen on Storm. He liked me, but he didn't really like Storm. Because he could be confrontational. But the joy of that was he believed in the process. He believed in the end result, and to him, the idea was everything. I was spending my time with doldrums. I was caught in a cauldron of hate. I felt persecuted and paralyzed. I thought that everything else would just wait. Poe and Storm go way, way back. But they were both friends of mine in Cambridge, oh, a couple of years after Storm. And they um, lived in a flat in South Kensington with a number of other people. Sid Barrett was one of them, and Nigel Gordon and David Gale, and people all lived in this flat. And uh, they had been to the, the film school, London Film School, and wanted to start a company doing visuals. And they started a company called it Gnosis with a G. They came to me, in fact, and asked if they could do the cover for a Source Full of Secrets album. And I managed to persuade the others to let them have a go, and they've, they've kind of been there ever since. There were a number of other people in that thing that was called Hypnosis, and it had some very um, pretentious piece of doggerel about the types of jobs that, that they would undertake, which was almost anything. <laughs> and they did do a few book covers and things like that at the beginning, but then it gradually narrowed down to being popular music album covers and later videos. So we, we go back with both those guys way over 50 years. But 
Before Storm died in 2013, there had been conversations with David and Nick about who would carry on the legacy of the artwork. And my name was put forward by Storm, and we talked about it openly before he died, that he said, I want you to, to, to carry on the tradition. So after he passed away, I sat with the guys and we talked about it all, and I said, okay, well, let's have a go at it. You know, I'm not Storm, but let's, let's do it. And it worked. And of course, I designed the exhibition, Their Mortal Remains, that was in the Victoria and Albert Museum, and that was hugely successful. And I think this really did establish my relationship back with Pink Floyd in that sense and carrying the baton on from Storm. So when we came to things like Endless River, Richard Wright had passed away, Storm Thorgerson had passed away. So there was a sense of looking back with Endless River to music and work that had been done before. It was quite an emotional time because we were looking at old footage of Rick in the studio, looking at photographs of him recording with them. and. I remember I presented about 20 different ideas from 20 different designers, including people like Damien Hurst, all sorts of people. They said, go and get whoever you want. Let's have a look. We, this is really important to us. By chance, I found this image online. I didn't know who it was from or what it was about, but it had an email address, and it was an email address which was in the Arab territories. I sent the boy an email. Amid Eldin. He replied and he said, yes, that's my idea. And I said, well, Pink Floyd would like to use it and we'd like to re-photograph it in our own way because it was a painting. He couldn't believe it. He lived in a little village on the border of Kuwait and Iraq. And he said, uh, I can't believe this is happening to me. You know, it was just wonderful. And the saddest thing was that we redid it. We, we, he, he proved it. He was happy. He was paid well for it. The saddest thing is he couldn't get permission from his country to come to England and celebrate the release of the album and be a part of that. So we made him a little bit of his own space in the exhibition, Their Mortal Remains at the V&A, so that people could recognise where this, this idea came from. But again, the idea was very appropriate. You know, um, if you look at the idea and it's a boatman um, rowing across the clouds, uh, into the distance, and it's again, very hypnosis in a way too, but it's also that sense of departure, and I think Endless River was certainly sort of looking around at what was left of Pink Floyd's music and putting it into a compilation and sending it on its way. Artwork for The Endless River, joining the esteemed catalogue of iconic Pink Floyd images, Poe's most recent challenge has been to create an image for the later years box set. I decided consciously that this album cover should be without any question what I call down the hypnosis vein of album covers, that surrealism, otherworldliness. So rather than design things all myself, I looked around to find people that I thought would be suitable, and I chose a guy called Michael Johnson, and I was very impressed with his studio's work and portfolio, so I suggested that he come up with some ideas. The front cover is, comprises of six different images. It's, it's a compilation of pictures put together. It's still all shot for real, but now we compose things digitally. You know, if I could have composed things digitally 50 years ago, I would have done, but it didn't exist. And thank God for modern technology, because it makes our lives a lot easier. So when you look at the picture, you see the twisted lampposts. That's one composition. And they're all separate. The landscape is shot in California, in Joshua Tree. And that's the foreground. The background landscape is shot further away in the Mojave Desert. The sky is a different composition altogether. We decided to shoot different skies and choose the best one. And if the girl is shot in Richmond Park in London. <laughs> the actual road, again, is shot in Joshua Tree, but is not in the same location as the foreground. 
So all of these elements I put together and I had Michael Johnson work with a CGI company in order to create that exactly the way that I wanted it and in the tones and the colors that I wanted. Um, and as you see, it's a sort of very uh, sunset, very moody, almost Martian kind of landscape. Again, to give this slight sci-fi feeling to it. You know. The idea actually comes from a sort of, uh, you know, I don't want to be too deep thinking about it, this, but there's definitely a logic behind it. And it's very representative of a person walking through a landscape and the power of that person has created these extraordinary twisted shapes out of the metal. And I'm trying to express something about Pink Floyd, the power of Pink Floyd, over these last few years. The power still goes on, they still go on, they still transform people's thoughts about Pink Floyd. This box set includes like seven hours of this previously unseen audiovisual stuff. There's a lot of stuff, and especially the visuals that accompany Dark Side album. Because it was constantly evolving, wasn't it, as you sort of brought it back. What can you tell me about going back and revisiting those films? Because there's a lot of you know, certain imagery, images of certain dictators or political figures kind of, it gets updated. Yeah. Each yeah, some of the films are updated um, for all sorts of things. For, for Dark Side of the Moon particularly, some of them have been updated two or three times. The, the very first original ones were done, some of them by Arthur Max, who was our lighting man back in the early 70s, um, and uh, by Peter Medak, who was um, a well-known film director of the ruling class, amongst other films. They were constantly updated, but, I mean, the Ian Eames time film has always remained there. Storm managed to do a couple of new films without me noticing <laughs> at vast expense for one or two things on the Division Bell Tour and for the Dark Side things. There was an on-the-run one which was all sperm whizzing around and we'd got the great on-the-run footage and then we did another one for on-the-run which is even better. What else was there? I can't even remember what some of these things were, but there were some crazed ideas by Storm were filmed and, and never used. Uh, the airship is 196 feet long, 67 feet high from the, from the ground to the top of the fin, and weighs about 7,000 pounds without the helium. Just now it weighs about 40 kilos. Let's talk about airships. Mm -hmm. Not a promotional yeah. tool. <laughs> Not a promotional tool many bands utilize. <laughs> some, some bright idea by someone I to was have looking, an airship. I was looking at the. I did have a little ride in it. It was fun. Yeah. So, so, so tell me, this 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 was a, a advanced promotional vehicle that was yeah. flown across America ahead yeah. of the yeah. Division Bell yeah. dates. Yeah. It was. <laughs> You know, all sorts of people in record companies and management companies and promoters come up with all sorts of ideas, and um, that was one baffling, really, but, uh, you know. I am authorized to read this message. You have spotted the Pink Floyd airship. Do not be alarmed. Pink Floyd have sent their airship to North America to deliver a message. The Pink Floyd airship is headed towards a destination where all will be explained upon arrival. Pink Floyd will communicate. The thing I remember most about it was going for a ride in it over Miami Beach and looking down from it at the beach in Miami and seeing all these people swimming in the first sort of 100 yards of water and all the sharks swimming amongst them. Literally, reasonable sized sharks. And these people didn't know. I guess they were sharks that weren't harmful and not about to bite anyone's legs or anything. But um, if the people who were swimming could see what I could see from, you know, a couple of hundred feet above, they'd have been out of that water like a shot. <laughs> there were just dozens. <laughs>
You've been listening to The Lost Art of Conversation, a Pink Floyd podcast. Coming up in episode four, we pick out some of the many gems in the later years box set, including one famous gig which took over a whole city. There's a, a floating barge platform in Norway that is 150 yards long and 100 yards wide, and we can tow it from Norway to Venice. That's through the North Sea, down the Channel, across the Bay of Biscay, through the Straits of Gibraltar, down past all of Spain, France, and Italy, and up the other side of Italy. And that is what happened. Don't forget to hit subscribe for the next episode of The Lost Art of Conversation, wherever you get your podcasts. And for more information on the new Pink Floyd The Later Years box set, to pre-order, order, or find out more what's inside this epic release, go to pinkfloyd.com now. <laughs>